Hi, everybody. Did everybody bite your nails off watching that movie? Because I watched it this afternoon. It was so tense in a good way, in a very good way. Let me put all this down. I'm Jim Halterman. I'm the West Coast Bureau Chief of TV Guide Magazine. I'm very excited to talk to, about this great film and talk to Helen Mirren, who's here tonight. So let's just, I'm not even going to go through all her credits. Let's bring her out. Helen Mirren. Thanks for coming. I'm so glad it wasn't raining like it was yesterday. I'm sure it would be like three people here, but thank you so much for coming. <laughs> well, before we dive into Eye in the Sky, I want to just talk to some career stuff a little bit. I always like to know the early origins. And, you know, I don't really know this. Was acting always the plan for you, even when you were younger? Well, I, I discovered dra uh, drama and the world of the imagination uh, when I was about 14 years old. Um, I didn't have, there wasn't really a drama program in my school, they didn't have that sort of thing in those days in Britain. Um, but I was introduced to Shakespeare and it was really through Shakespeare that I discovered this amazing world of drama, you know. I mean it was a great, great way in, I have to say. Um, so it, I did, I did kind of uh, hone in on, on, on becoming an actress, or at least becoming a, a part of someone who produces works of imagination um, at an early age. But, you know, I grew up in a very small town, the British equivalent of Coney Island, really, was uh, what it was, and um, uh, very unglamorous, and, you know, it seemed absolutely dreaming the impossible dream, you know, it was just so far out of my reach. I thought at the time to become an actress that, um, you know, I, I never sort of imagined that it would be possible, really. So, so what was it? Was it just that you <laughs> tried it a little bit and you got the acting bug? Because it doesn't sound like you had, you, you didn't grow up in the arts and you weren't no, in the No, no, I didn't, no, not at all. But, well, yes, I mean, I started, as I say, through, through Shakespeare, through watching a play of Shakespeare's Hamlet, actually it was, and um, when I was about 13 or 14, and and just being absolutely blown away by uh, by the story, you know. I, I mean, I watched it not knowing that Hamlet died at the end, you know, or or Ophelia went mad, or or who had killed the king, you know. So it was a thriller as much as anything, and I I was just absolutely transported. Um, I grew up without television. Uh, it, we we never had a television in my house, so. Um, maybe that was an advantage, I don't know. But not, not anymore, because there's great, great stuff on TV nowadays, isn't there? Yeah. So, so when, when in this course of just trying out different roles and things, did you finally go, this is my career, this is, I can make a living at this, or I can do this full time? Well, there was a wonderful organization in Britain called the National Youth Theatre. And that allowed people like me, who didn't have the financial background or or the um, contacts to sort of become an, ac an actor. It, it allowed people like me to, w National Youth Theatre did a play uh, in the summer holidays from school. And the incredible advantage, which I didn't kind of really understand at the time, was that the national critics, all the newspaper critics, the top critics, would come to see the National Youth Theatre productions. So, um, I, my English uh, teacher at school told me about the existence of the youth theatre. I didn't know anything about it. And she suggested I audition and gave me all the information. And in secret, I went off and auditioned and, and was accepted. Um, and it, you didn't have to pay or anything. You know, it was a, a, a you know, an organ, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a non-profit organisation. Um, so, uh, yes, I went off and auditioned for that, and then, the, you know, they gave me some nice roles, finishing up with playing Cleopatra and Anthony and Cleopatra at the age of 18. So, and all the national critics came, it was pretty cool, you know, it was amazing. <laughs> I was very lucky. Now, I have a hard time imagining Helen Mirren having to audition, 
but I'm sure you did early in your career. Were you a good auditioner? Was it something you were comfortable with or did it make no, you nervous? No, I was, was never very good at auditioning. I mean, I didn't mind. I mean, auditioning in the theatre was kind of okay because you're up there in a dark, you know, so they're all dark out there and you don't really see who's out there and you're in your little imaginative world on the stage. But auditioning for movies, I was hopeless at. I would just would always arrive angry, you know. <laughs> Angry and resentful, you know. Um, uh, uh, I, was very, I was very, very bad at auditioning here in America. I, I mean, I was lucky that I, got, I kind of got out of it pretty quickly, but no, I was terrible. I was going to say, the anger, though, could work if it's the right kind of role. Then well, it got good. me, it, absolutely, it got me a role in, in the film directed by the man who is now my husband. Um, because he was 20 minutes late and I was uh, I was steamingly angry. I was so pissed off. You know, I could be there on time for this interview, audition, really it was an audition, and he would keep me waiting. I was so angry. So I was very rude to him and, um, and sort of, you know, um, you know, what's the word, sort of off-putting, but, you know. Well, do you want to read? Shall we read? Is that what you want? <laughs> all right, I'll read. Fine. <laughs> all right, all right. Enough. I had enough. I'm because I'm going now. You know. <laughs> and, and you booked it. I, I, yes, because I didn't. Uh, the role was the head of the Kirov Ballet, this Russian, this very, uh, you know, autocratic Russian. So actually, uh, this was um, White Nights. This was White Nights. Yeah. Yes, yes. So inadvertently, not through trying, I have to say, I got the role. I was trying not to get the role because I was so cross. <laughs> I won't ask how you got him to marry you because... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he, he said the most amazing thing. I was very pissed off with him and, and I was pissed off in general at being a, basically a British stage actress, auditioning in America when no one had heard of me, didn't they know I was a famous Cleopatra, you know. <laughs> um, and they, you know, they dissed me majorly. So, um, uh, I, you know, I was, I was in general, I was sort of pissed off when I would go to these auditions. Um, so, and then him being late on top, it was just like too much for me. Um, so I was like, oh, you Hollywood asshole, you know. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> and uh, and then he said the most amazing thing. He said, I, "You know, I've met you before." And I said, "I don't think so." You know. Like that. <laughs> and he said, "Yes, I met you in San Juan Batista." And I went, "Whoa!" He saw me in San Juan Batista because I had worked in San Juan Batista with the Teatro Campesino. I don't know how many of you are aware of the Teatro Campesino, but it was an agitprop theatre based, um, based out of San Juan Batista, which was basic, uh, basically agitprop for the uh, Cesar Chavez's um, movement to, for the farm workers union. So I met Cesar Chavez, in fact, it was an amazing experience. And, and we were out on the picket lines with Cesar and, and, the, and the farm workers union. But anyway, I was doing uh, experimental theater work with Peter Brook and we were working in San Juan Batista. And when Taylor said, I, I saw you in San Juan Batista working with Peter Brook, I went, whoa, this is not a normal sort of my idea of a Hollywood film director, you know, that this, cause this was really, really esoteric. Um, so I, I changed my mind about him there and then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we could spend the whole night just going over all your films and theater and everything. But I do want to ask, just as an actor, when you're finished with a role, do you let it go? Or does it kind of live with you? Because I know some people that say when the, when the movie's over or the play's over, they just they put it in the past and it's over. But how do you approach that? I think, yes, you want it to be in the past. You want to move on. Um, some, sometimes you're not allowed to move on, um, either because people want to keep, as you guys all know, your actors, they want to keep casting you in the, the last thing that you did that you were really good in. 
not sort of understanding that if you're good in that, you actually can be good in other things. Uh, <laughs> you know, they want to stick you in the box that, you know, that you've proved yourself in. Um, but but I, 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 yes, I always want to move on, and I, I go back quite reluctantly if I have to, but... Um, I, no, you do. It's it's funny. It, it it drops away really fast. Okay. Any roles that you would like to go back to, whether it's something a long time ago or something. Oh my recent? goodness! Almost all of them, and tr just do them better. You know, <laughs> um, I, I'm very critical of myself, and and um, you know, I, I always think, oh, you, you blew it. You really, sh you know, it was terrible. Mm. Well, tell. Tem <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, so you book a project, whether it's a film or a play or anything, what's your process? When do you start getting to work? Whether it's some, I'm assuming it's before the first day of shooting or... Sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Um, uh, I'm terribly lazy. It's awful. Um, I'm always in a panic the last three, three days. <gasps> I've got to learn my Russian accent. I haven't started on it. And I'm shooting in three days' time. You know. <laughs> Terrible. Um, but sometimes I'm good, and I, I, I you know, and I, I, I prepare. What stuff like the Queen, you know, I had to prepare, you know. But I am unbelievably lazy. It's terrible. You, you play, you played a lot of fictional characters, but you have also played like the Queen. You have played real people. Mm. Do you have a preference, or is there a different way you approach it? When you know, like the Queen, there's things you could look at, or there's things you could study. How do you approach that? Real people. Uh, yes, of course, you know, I mean, it's great because it's both great and it's, I, I always said when, when I was, before I did The Queen, I, I always said I'll, I'll never play a living person because you can't win. You know, you'll only ever be 55% as good as they are at being themselves, you know. <laughs> so, uh, or if you're 95%, you're going to look like an impersonator. So y you can't really win. Um, uh, uh, but playing the Queen, um, I liberated myself by thinking of it as just another portrait. It was just my portrait of her. But it wasn't her, it was just my portrait of her. As artists do portraits of people and they, they put as much of themselves in it, really, in a way. Uh, or their observation of that, of that person. Do you like to watch yourself? I know some actors do, some don't. Where do you fall on that? No, I don't. I I never go to the you know the, to the uh, you know uh, video screen and watch. I never watch. No, and don't really. I go quite reluctantly to see a, a film. You know, directors always really want you to, and they are quite right. They want you to see what music they've put on and what what they've cut out of your performance. And <laughs> <laughs> Where they've revoiced you and stuff like that. <laughs> so, so are there a lot of projects that you've just you've never seen as far as your film work? Just you've never seen yes, them at all. Yes, yes, I think there are projects I've never seen. Yes, yeah. Okay, well, we'll, we'll all watch them multiple times for you. <laughs> well, let's talk about Eye in the Sky. How did that come to you? The project. It's it's really a wonderful movie. I was it just saying how tense came, it is. You know, as they, I, I was in the classic way. You know, sent as a script and and I was. Uh, it was just a great script. It was the, what you see on the screen, you know. This was not, I, I think that um, the director, Gavin Hood, and the writer, Guy Hibbert, had done a lot of work on the script before it got to me. But by the time it got to me, it was almost exactly what you see up there on the screen, which is quite rare, because often, you know, it, a script will go through, uh, as you know, three or four drafts after you receive it. Well, and it, it really takes us into a side of something. You know, a lot of times we see the photograph after something horrific like this happens. But this is all the decision making, all the different voices. How did you approach your character with Colonel Powell and where she was coming from and her, her doing her job but also being human? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really interesting. I, I really wanted to do this film. Um, I had a conflict with another film. And I said to my agent, if there is a conflict, and the other film was a much bigger budget and a sort of bigger, more established sort of thing, um, I said, it, it, it's eye in the sky that I want to do. And it wasn't because I wanted to play the character, because 
in a way, it's not a very interesting character. You know, you don't really know very much about her. But I wanted to be in the movie and a part of a part of the telling of that particular story, which I thought was told so so brilliantly in the script. Um, and in this context, with this role, you really were just fulfilling. You, you were um, um, just giving the story what it needed and no more. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it wasn't a situation where you could say, "Oh, I think a scene, you know, with uh, with my with uh, you know, I think I need the scene where I show how vulnerable I am, how vulnerable I am really inside. That really I'm a person of great feeling, and you know, I it would have been wrong in the in this movie. So since that's that wasn't a part of the movie, did you have to create that for yourself though, just so you know who this woman is and why she's doing what she's doing? I, I spoke to military people um, and to, to find out who this woman would have been, someone who joined the military at a time when uh, it was much more difficult for women to join the military, and then also had been successful in the military. What qualities would she have had to have had to have got to the position of colonel? Um, so th those were important questions for me to know and understand. Um, but having said that, I didn't complicate it with psych psychology at all. It was just someone doing their job. One, one of the things I noticed watching the film is everybody's kind of sectioned off in different places. What are the challenges in acting there? Because a lot of times you're just, you know, you're looking at a screen, but you're talking or you're talking to somebody on a headset. What are the challenges instead of having somebody directly you know, across from you to read lines, lines off of? Uh, well, um, I was the first one. Uh, Gavin, because of budgetary uh, requirements, had to shoot each one of us separately. So I did all of my stuff, then I went away, and then Aaron came in and shot all of his stuff, and then they went away, and then the politicians came in, and last of all, he shot all the stuff on the, on the, on the ground. So when I was reacting I was reacting to a, a completely blank screen you know and I and I hadn't seen any of the material so Gavin had to talk me through it um, and then when I was on the phone I was on the phone to Gavin the director not Alan Rickman sadly um, but you know that's what we do isn't it we use our imaginations that's what we do is, it, is that tougher for you or are you able just still to lock into what you need to do in the scene I mean, it's always, it's lovely to, obviously, I mean, my favorite scene is, is a two shot, you know, where there's two actors in the shot and you can, you can really play a thing through with another actor. Otherwise, in, in so much of film acting, you're actually acting with a camera. You know, you can't, there's someone sort of squashed up aside, you know, alongside of it like this, you know, <laughs> doing their lines, but really that, that's meaningless, isn't it? You, you can't say you're sort of acting with that person, you're not. Um, you're often acting to a little piece of tape on the side of the camera. So, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's just one of the techniques you have to use in film acting. Well, you brought up Alan Rickman. This was one of his last films, but you didn't. It's his you, last film. It was his last mm. one. I know. I knew he had another one out earlier this year. I think. But yeah. This was the last yeah, one. Yeah. This was the last one he shot. Yes. Okay. Which you didn't have scenes with him, so there's not much I can ask you about. But had you worked with him before at all? I knew him very well, uh, and in fact, um, I'd spoken to him. I'd bumped into him in London before, after both of us had agreed to this movie, but before we'd shot it, and and uh, I knew that he was going to be, and he knew I was going to be in it. So we sort of said. You said yes to that movie, and, and we both had said yes for exactly the same reason, which not to play the character, oh, what a fantastic character, not at all, just what an amazing story, and what an amazing way of presenting this moral dilemma without making any judgments whatsoever, allowing the audience to make all the, all the sort of moral judgments about it. And I, and I didn't know the, mm. all the, the drones, the little, like, the little bug that would fly into the room and the humming, but that was all new. I was fascinated by that because it also made yes. me a little paranoid that you know, there could be <laughs> things in here. Like, what's watching? It's the way of the future. It's the way of the future. 
Well, what, what does a role need to have for you to say yes? Because you do do big budget things, you do more smaller independent things. What, what's kind of the one or two things that a role has to have? Well, first of all, it's got to be different from the last thing I did, you know. Uh, and um, I don't know, it's just like, I don't know. It, it, it's always different things, isn't it? It can be this where I go, oh, that's an amazing story, fill, um, you know, script and story, and I just want to serve that story. Fast Eight, I just want to be in Fast Eight, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, I just do, you know. Um, uh, and I, I've just done a, a, a film with Donald Sutherland, a sort of a road, road movie with Donald Sutherland, um, directed by an Italian director called ba Paolo Virzi. And um, that was, you know, it's a two-hander. Um, it, it, it's just, you know, different, different, different movies just have, I don't know, I just, I, I let my instinct work. Yeah. I love that you're doing Fast 8, though. That's, that'll be amazing. Yeah. Are, you, are we actually going to see you drive and do some of the... the I'm not allowed to say. <gasps> they oh. are so strict. Really? Oh, my God, they're so strict. <laughs> you're not allowed to say a word. They don't want anything to get out. Well, I'm not even it, allowed to say whether <laughs> I drive or not. Wow. Well, because if anybody's seen the Red movies or other ones, like... You can hold your own. You can do it. <laughs> well, you know, you're, I, it's not me. You know, they make you look as if you can hold your own because it, you know. <laughs> well, you have done so much in your career, whether it's film, stage, television, everything. Do you have anything left on your bucket list? What's, what do you still want to do as far as an actor? I, I want to be, I, I really want to be surprised and surprise myself and, um, uh, and I, you know, I, I sit watching incredible work um, and I'm very inspired by other actors' work all the time. And it drives me on. It makes me want to re-engage in, in this wonderful um, process that we have of, of um, reflecting the world around us, educating the world around us, entertaining the world around us. Um, I, I think what actors and writers and directors do is an extremely important part of um, human life and, and i'm very proud to be an actor yeah that's great um <laughs> yeah well said we're gonna get to some audience questions here in a second one of my favorite parts of your history is prime suspect and i'm curious as yeah <laughs> right Thank you, yeah. I'm curious as an actor because that's a character you were with for a long time, the different, the different mm. seasons or different mm. films that you did. How was that different for you or rewarding because it was a character you could really dig into over a period of time? Well, it was, I, on Prime Suspect, I never tried to control it. Um, I got into a position when you've played that role, you know, for a long time, I could have controlled, but I always let the, the writers, because I'm a great believer in in writers and and in writers having the um, uh, uh, being allowed to write what they want to write that f for their writing to come from within themselves not to come from other people's notes you know so um, I never gave any of the writers notes I just said write what you think this is where she is that's, this is her history up to now you know take it wherever you want um, and then, as an actor, I would then respond to what the writer had, had you know, had seen in it. Um, and it wasn't. It was a really interesting process. That it, it wasn't like doing a normal sort of TV ser uh, American TV series. We did a, a four-hour um, story every eighteen months. So I, I'd have long periods off in between when I could do other things, which was great. Um, and then every eighteen months or so, I'd come back. To this character, and it was just—it was like meeting an old, old school friend, you know, someone I knew really, really well, um, but that I could greet. I hadn't seen for years, but I could greet as if I'd only seen her yesterday, you know. Um, it was an—it was a nice, it was a great thing. All right, we're gonna get some questions here. Um, Crystal has a question. Where's Crystal? Crystal. Crystal's gone home. Oh, Crystal's all the way in the oh, back. Oh, she's way at the back. Um, <laughs> Crystal would like to know, 
<laughs> do you still get nervous before you go to set or before you go on stage? And what do you do to calm those nerves if you have them? I do get nervous. I do, especially at the beginning of a film, because you never know. You, you know, you don't know what characters, personalities you're going to have to deal with, and and a film set, as you guys know, is such an intense, potentially terrifying, um, but intense place, um, and and it's really dealing with all those personalities that that really scares me. I'm not very. Um, I'm not a very sort of gregarious person, but um, so I'm always very nervous about that. Um, and I'm always incredibly grateful when I'm treated with kindness. <laughs> um, uh, I get very nervous on stage. That, that's when I really get really, really scared. Um, but in, I, th I think you know you can't you can't maintain a level of nervousness on film because your your day is so long you know, um, so the nerves those sorts of nerves sort of drop away, um, but you know it's terrifying. Uh, Rob Banks, where's Rob? Others, hey Rob. Um, he wants to know: um, Is there a specific daily ritual that you do to keep yourself focused or inspired? Or is there any? Rituals that kind of just to keep you locked into what you're doing as far as an actor. Um, I I certainly get I get pretty ritualistic when I'm on stage because just to maintain the energy level that you need. It's very so weird, isn't it? Stage work because it's you look at it, it's two hours a day you're working, you know, but somehow your whole day is geared towards getting the energy, what you eat, when you eat, everything, everything is carefully calibrated towards that moment when the curtain goes up and you have to be, you know, there and full of energy and not sleepy and not hungover and <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Um, but um, so more on the, on, the, on the stage, it's very different in film because your whole you know, your whole rhythm is constantly being thrown out. In the beginning of the week, you can be waking up at four in the morning to be on set by six or seven, and by the end of the week, you know, you're getting up at two in the afternoon and working through the night because of the time sometimes when it gets pushed. So your whole clock is constantly, you know, changing it. That's difficult. Mm. Question from Melinda York. Where's Melinda? Hey, Melinda. Hi there. Um, one, mm -hmm. one of her questions is, what is your secret for memorization? Do you have any tricks for memorizing? Oh, God, we're always looking for tricks, aren't we? <laughs> I know. I heard at one point that if you, if you learn, when you're learning your lines, if you can smell a certain smell, then, and then when you go to sleep, if you continue smelling the same smell, you'll remember the lines. So I got all these perfumed candles, you know, so I'd sit learning my lines with this perfumed candle, and then I'd go to sleep with the perfumed candle still, still burning in the hopes that I'd sort of <laughs> remember them better. Um, there's, all, there's all sorts of theories. Um, but it is true that if you, if you look at your lines just before you go to sleep, uh, you do seem to... It, they do seem to go in, uh, not completely, but you know, just look at them, not even try to learn them, just read them through. Um, otherwise, it's just sort of hard work. I mean, when I did The Tempest, the film of The Tempest, I had to learn the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but I had to learn it. I had to learn the whole play, basically, before I shot a single scene because Shakespeare you know it's not like anything else you've got to know it backwards to be able to perform it forwards so um, I had to and that's the first time I've ever done that and I was amazed that I had the capability to do it but I did how, how did you do it because I know, I know Shakespeare is very specific you know you're just you know brutal just sitting and just Learning that line, learning those three words, you know, over and over again, and then the next three words, and then that line, and then that scene, and then it. Um, but it's amazing; it does come. It's amazing. Okay. Do, do you? It took about two months. Okay. 
Mm. Well, because you do, you do stage, you do film, you do television, is there a different approach for each one? Because stage is one thing, film is another. Do you approach the characters differently or is it all kind of the same kind of work? Well, you do approach them because, you know, the whole process of, of getting to your moment of performance is very different. You know, obviously in, in theatre you, you have three, four, five, six weeks of rehearsal, so um, your process of working towards that, you know, that characterization is, is so different. On, on film, sometimes you have no rehearsal at all, which is kind of exciting. I mean, I, I don't mind that. Or you have directors that like to rehearse quite, quite a lot. Um, it's all about, you know, film acting is all about freedom. And it's so hard to find that freedom. A uh, question from Virginia. Where's Virginia? There she is. Um, she wants to know, any, anything you do that helps you click with the character or connect with the character? Is there anything you do just so you can actually really connect with the character you're playing? Well, again, it, it depends who, uh, you know, if it's a real character, imaginative character. I mean, I love costume, and, and those moments of the costume fittings are, are incredibly important. And also the set, and I've often walked onto a set and said, this is wrong, from, this is just not my character's place. You know, do you mind if I m make some adjustments, you know? And other sets you walk onto and you go, I can't believe the set dresser has totally got this character. This is perfect. And it's amazing when that happens. Because, you know, you're, 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 if it's your environment, your home, your house, is the character's house, you know, how it looks is incredibly uh, revealing of a character. So it's very, very important. It's as important as your costume or your makeup, I think. And do you have a lot of those things thought out before these things happen? Like before you go on set, do you think about that, or is it more just a gut yeah, feeling? Yeah, no, it's uh, you know, as you as you start making the, you know, is this a neat person or a tidy person? You know, what is the art that would be on the wall? You know, is this is this a cushiony person? Would she have loads of cushions around, or like hard sofas that you sit on like this? You know, it's you know, it, it's very, very, very important for your character, the the environment. Well, that's a good place to stop. But thank you so much for being here, and thanks thank to you, you all for being much. here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.